Well, look, the big question, you know, why do some outsourcing projects work? And they do work, and they work very, very well. And others, spectacular failure, never want to think about it ever again, uh, whichever one those statements are. And, you know, it really does become a mystery, and I think, you know, there's no single answer for that. So if you're looking at me for the one answer, you're certainly not going to get it. But for the next 35 minutes, I'm, I'm certainly willing to share with you um, the experiences and the, the observations that I've formed over the last 20 years in managing fleet care um, on being on the, the supplier side of uh, looking at successful and unsuccessful outsourced programs. And before you think I'm putting myself on a pedestal to say, we told you you didn't get that right, uh, let me point out that fleet care has done a couple of outsourced programs uh, for non-essential services of our own, and the school's 2-1 at the moment. So, hey, we haven't got it right either in all, in all cases. So, um, I've, as I said, 35 minutes. Um, I've allowed some amount of time for question time, but look, I think if you've got a question, um, if you've got, because uh, I'm coming from a supplier side, so I think if you've got a challenge or a point of view, please throw it up as we go along, because I'll certainly compensate to make sure we finish on time. So the, the whole process, as you know, it starts at the tender. Hopefully that my sales team have done the good job and they've already been out uh, to, you, uh, to your users, to your, uh, to your buying team, and they've gathered some intel and they've built a bit of a relationship waiting for this tender to come out. And they've really built the anticipation so that we know what you're about before it lands. But the first time that we, we really do see, I suppose, the formal sense of your organisation is when this tender document lands. And, you know, the email comes through, we get the notification, we get all excited, the 60-page document rolls up, we open it, and probably within about 10 minutes we're all sitting going, oh, my gosh, what do these people want? You know, what's up with them? Now, to be fair, on the other side, we probably send back our response, and you're all going, can't they just answer a simple question? What's wrong with them? So it works two ways. So we're going to have a little look at the, the tender side. Operational sabotage, this is something we live, we live with. Uh, you probably live with a little bit, but we certainly live with it. Maybe a better statement might be buy a disconnect or something like that, but I like sabotage, it sort of sounds better. Cherry picking the services, this is probably a little bit unique to Fleet because we've got so many services bundled in the, in the one facility, but we'll talk about that and briefly touch on the, the carrot and the stick at the end. So as I said, we've got a bit of time for questions as we go, so please jump in if you like. So when this tender arrives, we, we try to categorise it into four groups. Um, and I'm not going to talk much about the last one, the one that opportunity knocks, and that's the one where if something's really going to happen. Um, but we'll focus on the first three, and, and my personal unfavourite, of course, is never going to happen. And the great thing about this tender, I suppose, the first one, A, the testing the water, doesn't happen as much as it used to. Um, and this is very much typically, you know, it's that we just want to find out what's going on, um, get some pricing or something like that. But, 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 you know, I've been involved, and I'm sure all of you have been involved at some stage where, you know, there's a high cost to go out with a tender, high cost to respond to it, we've done presentations, we've been involved and nothing happens at the end. And I don't think it's any good for any of the organisations when that does occur, because you're less sort of thinking, well, when they go out next time, are they serious or whatever? So I'd certainly encourage um, doing the RFI, um, being honest out there and saying, look, we only want some information. Um, certainly in the fleet industry, where I'm from, we very much like the sound of our own voices. So we're more than happy to come along and sit with you all day and talk and tell you about how good we are and what the industry does do. Uh, so the consultation path certainly works well. Our second unfavourite is the embedded incumbent. Um, and probably the best way to describe it is history of no change. And, and we have one particular organisation that tenders every three years. Now, they've had the same supplier now for 12 years. But every three years, on the month, on the day, I have to tell you, I could set my calendar to it, out comes the tender. And we all look at it. Now, this organisation is tight with the supplier. And per se, I actually don't have a problem with that. But I prefer they were a little bit honest about it and maybe 
Maybe look at a slightly longer period. Maybe give them a three plus, two plus one or something like that. Or maybe just give up and just stick with them. Test the market. Get a few of the uh, competitors in and just have a little look if the price is right. Because none of us tender anymore. I mean, they rang us last time and said, why didn't you tender? I said, well, we've done it four times. And the last time I gave you a really ridiculous price and you didn't even respond to that. I thought it was at least going to ups upset the apple cart. I mean, I have to tell you, I was panicking. If we'd won, we would have been in big trouble. But, you know, it was a bit of fun on the way. So I think if you've got a buying group who clearly locked in with that supplier, maybe look at approaching it a slightly, a slightly different way, because we're getting a little bit sick of just tendering over and over. The, the predetermined winner, and I'm actually glad Bella's not here, because you'll probably throw something at me, um, you know, because this is often the domain of council, um, and if you've ever looked at council uh, bids for a particular vehicle, you know, you look at it, you know, two. 2,533 cc engine and a blah, 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 with a 179 litre boot. You think, hang on a minute, what car's got a 179 litre boot? And you look it up, it's a Camry. Well, why didn't they say they wanted a Camry in the first place? So the predetermined tender um, on that style is quite obvious. But of course, the other one is the one that uses a lot of proprietary language. And it's nice if we've been involved with that organisation, we've managed to slip our proprietary language into their tender. I mean, that's pretty good. But at the end of it, on the opposite side, if you're trying to get a lot of buyers, sorry, a lot of suppliers coming into you, it can put some of them off. Because we certainly read the tender and start to go, who do they really want? Is this a tender for lease plan or is it a tender that is seriously open to anybody? The, we don't want to change. Um, and this is probably the biggest nightmare for yourselves. Um, you know, operationally, the organisation's happy and we're about to get involved in a tender and we know it's coming and the operational team are very happy and we're not the incumbents, so it's going to be something tough to break. But, but the change has been forced upon them for some reason. Uh, that reason could be the tender, you know, the rules of engagement of your organisation and, and you must go to tender. Um, or it could be an internal change within that buying um, group where they've decided they want to look at something different. And for us on the, on the opposite side, it's actually quite difficult for us to detect this. And because it's difficult to detect, often the problem doesn't manifest itself until we're actually in the, in the seat and we've, we've won. And then we're suddenly sitting there going, we, we've actually got an issue. And the types of things that often happen with these tenders is you know, the buying group didn't want to change. Um, so they start cherry picking at the services or they start um, going through a little bit of sabotage to, to prove that what they had previously worked exceptionally well and they actually have no intention of allowing this current contract to work. Um, and I think a good example, um, a good example of that is, is the, the layers of complexity that come in. And more often than not, it's, it's when it comes out from a, perhaps a currently insourced solution to, a, to an outsource. And an example I'll give you, which is my industry, which is the fleet industry. The organisation's got six people in their fleet business. They decide that they're going to outsource fleet um, or part of it. And they go through this, this process of tendering it. They bring us on board. We've won it. We come in with our box of tricks. And it's a little bit like going to the gym and you get to the locker room and every locker's taken up and we've got our box and we're sort of trying to work out where we're actually going to put it. So then what occurs is that we've got, say, five or six people in this, this current fleet team and nothing's going to change because they're now protecting their jobs. So we start to find the overlays happen. We put a they put in a specification out for a vehicle so we do the supply side for the vehicle. Then they say, well, send that to us and we'll check it. And we'll go, well, we've already done that. Why do you want to look at it? Because you already told us what it is. You gave it to us. We've repeated it. Now we're giving it back to you again to check it again. So the layers start to increase. And I'll give you some other layers later as we, as we move on. But this is a, is a serious problem that starts to occur. And actually occurs a lot, especially in a situation where you've currently got a buy team um, and you've tried to outsource it. And the head of these teams, and, and, and if I might use an example again of the fleet manager, uh, not the external one, the internal one, can be just as guilty of actually coming through and deciding they want change and invoking change, but actually forgetting to sell it. So we, we look at them as the change agent, and they put all this effort 
into selling it upwards, up into the upper management of the business to convince them that this is the right way to go. But what they actually fail to do is they sometimes completely forget to even engage their own team. Again, this is where we're starting to build the issue of the layers. And their team, being in this case, let's say the fleet team, they don't really do much at all for the users or the drivers. Now, potentially for the drivers in this example, maybe it's not that important. They probably just need to know at the end. But certainly from the operational team, they haven't been involved early and this change cycle has been starting to go through. And we find that the operational team becomes quite disillusioned and they actually become confused. They don't know what their position is anymore within this contract or within that, within that, uh, within that category. And they start to fill the gaps. 